Hey guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering congestive heart failure and myocardial infarction, the heart attack. If you haven't done so already, guys, please be sure to like and subscribe below. Press that red notification button so you'll be notified every time a new video is released. And guys, I am now on TikTok. So if you've been binging on all my videos on this channel and you want more, be sure to check out more videos on my TikTok. So without any further ado, guys, let's get started. First question. The client is admitted to the telemetry unit diagnosed with acute exacerbation of CHF. Which signs and symptoms would the nurse expect to find when assessing this client? One, apical pulse rate of 110 and four plus pitting edema of the feet. Two, thick white sputum and crackles that clear with cough. Three, the client sleeping with no pillow and eupnea, eupenia. Four, radial pulse rate 90 and capillary refill less than three seconds. If you're new to my channel or you just need some extra time just to think and formulate an answer, just press the pause button and whenever you're ready, press play and we'll resume. So the correct answer for this question, guys, is one, apical pulse of 110 and four plus pitting edema. So why do we see that apical pulse of 110? Why would we um, expect to see that in a patient with CHF? First of all, the regular heart rate is 50 to 100. Anything higher than 100 is um, tachycardia, right? So why is the heart rate so high? Because the patient has so much fluid that they're holding on to, fluid in the heart, that the heart rate increases because it's trying to push all of that fluid and blood out. That's why you see that heart rate goes going up. It's trying its best. Not too successfully, but it is trying. It's trying to get all of that blood and fluid out. It's trying to push it out to the systemic uh, circulation. That's why you see the heart rate up. The pitting edema. Why? Patient has all this fluid. It's got to go somewhere. And so that's why you see that pitting edema. Uh, something else that you see with patients with CHF, fatigue. They're going to be tired all the time. Why? Remember, oxygen is what feeds your tissues, right? Oxygen is carried in hemoglobin, which is carried in the blood. The heart is having a hard time pumping all that blood, which means pumping all that oxygen to the tissue. So this patient is going to be tired all the time. Anything makes them tired because they already are not getting enough oxygen. Uh, another thing you may hear S3 sounds, which is not good, guys. That indicates ventricular failure, which can be life-threatening. Of course, um, you may also see the edema. You can see the jugular vein distension that lets you know that this patient's going through fluid overload, which is really what's happening with this type of patient. Now, let's look at our other answer choices. We have one, thick white sputum and crackles that clear without cough. Actually, um, the sputum for the CHF patient is going to be frothy, not clear. And the second part, crackles that clear without cough. cough. That's another thing that CH patients normally have, crackles. You hear crackles in the lung. Why? Because of fluid. Remember, the patient's holding on to all this fluid. It's got to go somewhere. So eventually it spills into the lungs and you'll hear crackles in the lungs. And the patient with CHF, when they have crackles in the lungs, it'll make them cough, but it doesn't clear with cough. They'll cough, 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 and you can still hear the crackles because they still have that fluid. So that's wrong. You have choice number three. It says sleep, the client sleeping with no pillow and eupenium. First of all, that patient with CHF that already has difficulty sleeping, they're not going to be sleeping without any pillows. They're going to be sleeping with their head elevated. Why? They need to take pressure off of their diaphragm, which is putting pressure onto the lungs, making the lungs not be able to expand, okay? So they're going to need to be sleeping elevated, and they're definitely not going to have eupenia. They're going to have dyspenia. They're going to have difficulty breathing. And then choice four, a radial pulse rate of 90 and a capillary refill of um, less than three seconds. We're going to be checking their apical pulse, not their radial pulse. That's number one. And number two, with the capillary refill, we expect it to be more than three seconds because of decreased circulation, not less than three seconds. So that's why number one is the correct answer. Next question. The nurse is developing a nursing care plan for a client diagnosed with CHF. A nursing diagnosis of decreased cardiac excuse me, output related to inability of the heart to pump effectively is written, which short-term goal would be best for the client? The client will, one, be able to ambulate in the hall by the date of discharge. 
Two, have an audible S1 and S2 with no S3 heard by end of shift. Three, turn cough deep breathe every two hours. Or four, have a pulse ox reading of 98% by day two of care. And guys, the correct answer is two, have an audible S1 and S2 and no S3 by end of shift. This actually meets all of our qualifications. This is a wonderful goal and it's a short-term goal by the end of the shift. What do we want to see happen? That the patient has an S1 and S2. Those are our normal heart sounds, our lub, dub, lub, dub, lub, dub. That's for S1, S2. Wonderful. What else? We don't want to hear any S3. Remember, S3 is a life threatening symptom of what? Ventricular failure. So this is a great goal to have. Now let's look at our wrong answer choices. We have one, they'll be able to ambulate in the hall by date of discharge. Um, first of all, by date of discharge, that's not a short term goal. All right. And number two, be able to ambulate in the hall. The problem that this patient has is not a physical problem. They can ambulate. The problem is when they ambulate, they can't breathe. They can't catch their breath. Okay, so number one's wrong. Three, turn, cough, deep breathe every two hours. That's actually a nursing intervention. It's a wonderful nursing intervention, but it's not a goal. So that's wrong. And then you have choice four, half pulse ox reading of 98% um, by day two of care. Actually, we want that pulse ox reading by 98%. We want that the whole time they're here, right? That's number one. And number two, that would be a better goal for a patient who has... Um, uh, nursing diagnosis of impaired oxygen exchange, right? That would be a better diagnosis. So with all these choices, number two is the best. We want to hear that love dub, which is normal. And we don't want to hear that S3, which is a life threatening. The nurse is developing a discharge teaching plan for the client diagnosed with CHF. Which intervention should be included in the plan? Select all that applies. And guys, if you've been following me for any amount of time, you know that we treat select all that applies as what? True, false. We're gonna go through each line. And if it's true, we keep it. If it's false, we throw it out, okay? So number one, notify the doctor of a weight gain of more than one pound in a week. That's false. We need them to notify us if they gain two to three pounds within a day, all right? We're not waiting a whole week within a day. If they gain two to three pounds within a day, they need to notify us, so that's false. Two, teach a client how to count the radial pulse when taking digoxin or cardiac glycoside. Absolutely. Why is that important? Well, digoxin is, um, like I said, a cardio, cardiac glycoside, but what it does, the, the work of digoxin, it strengthens the contractility of the heart. So remember how I told you that patient had all this fluid in their heart? So the heart was trying to push out all this fluid, so it's probably going like this because there was just too much fluid to push out. But then they get the digoxin, it increases the contractility, which makes the heart be able to push out so much more blood and fluid. Wonderful. But there's something else that digoxin does. Even though it increases the contractility of the heart to help that heart push out way more blood and fluid, it decreases the heart rate. So guess what? If a patient's heart rate is 60 and they take digoxin, what do you think is going to happen? They're going to bottom out. You, the normal range for the heart rate, I already told you, is 60 to 100. So that patient absolutely must take their pulse before they take the digoxin because if their pulse is too low, are they gonna take the digoxin? Absolutely not. So those are very two important things you need to know about digoxin. Three, instruct the client to remove the salt shaker from the dinner table. Absolutely. Why? We know that fluid follows sodium. This patient's already holding on to too much fluid. Do we want them to ingest any more sodium so that they'll be hold on to even more fluid? Absolutely not. So this is good. We're going to tell them no salt. Uh, next question and uh, next choice. Encourage the client to monitor the urine output for change of color to become dark, false, um, not necessary. Um, if anything, because of the diuretics that I'm sure this patient's going to be on, we're going to expect to see their urine get lighter and we're going to expect to see them urinate way more because they're going to be on diuretics to get rid of all this fluid that they're retaining. Uh, choice five, discuss the importance of taking loop um, diuretic furosemide at bedtime. Oh my gosh, guys, this is a perfect example of how these test writers will try to trick you. 
They gave you a beautiful first half of an answer and everything after that was wrong. What do I always tell you? If the whole thing isn't right, the whole thing is wrong. You throw it out. So yes, this patient may be on loop diuretics because we've got to get rid of all this fluid, but we don't take diuretics at nighttime. We don't teach patients to take diuretics at nighttime. Why? They're going to be sleeping and then they have to get up and urinate. They're waking up from sleep and a lot of these patients have other comorbidities. They're elderly. When they're waking up from sleep, they may already be confused just because they were waking up from sleep and it's nighttime, boom, they have a fall. No, we want them to take their diuretics in the morning. So by the time nighttime comes, they can have their full night of sleep without having to keep getting up to go urinate. Okay, next question. The nurse enters the room of the client diagnosed with congestive heart failure. The client is lying in bed, gasping for breath, is cool and clammy, and has buccal cyanosis. Which intervention would the nurse implement first? One, sponge the client's forehead. Two, obtain a pulse ox reading. Three, take the client's vital signs. Or four, assist the client to a sitting position. This is another trick question. The answer is four, assist them to a sitting position. Let me tell you something, these test writers, no, as students, you always want to choose assess, 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 assess. You always do that first, right? But you have to look at the clinical picture. Do you have enough information presented to you for you to intervene? And in this situation, you absolutely do, okay? Assessing that patient, how is that going to help them? We know what's wrong with them. They can't breathe. What's the first thing we're going to do? We're going to put them in the sitting position. What did I tell you about that elevated position, the semi fowler's position? It takes uh, pressure off of the diaphragm, right? That the diaphragm is not pushing up against the lungs, making it harder to breathe. You absolutely want to do that. Now, choices one, two, and three, none of those will help the patient breathe. The problem right now is the patient's physiological integrity. They cannot breathe. If you can't breathe, you're gonna die, right? So we need to fix that right away. Listen to their lungs, taking their vital signs, all that good stuff, that can come later. But right now, we have to make sure that patient can breathe. So the first thing we're going to do is put them in a sitting position. That alone is going to decrease the workload on the heart and help them receive more oxygenation. The nurse is assessing a client diagnosed with CHF. Which signs and symptoms would indicate that the medical treatment has been effective? Oh, guys, sorry, let me fix this camera. Okay, where was I? One, the client's peripheral pitting edema has gone from three plus to four plus. Two, the client's able to take the radial pulse, pulse accurately. Three, the client's able to perform ADLs without dyspnea. Or four, the client has minimal G JVD, jugular vein distension. And the correct answer, guys, is three. The client's able to perform ADLs without dyspnea. That's how we know that the treatment's effective. They're starting to get better. They're able to move around more without being short of breath, okay? Now, let's look at our other choices. Um, one, the client's peripheral edema has gone from a three plus to four plus. Well, that's even worse. You went from having three plus edema to four plus edema. That doesn't show the patient's getting better. That shows the patient's getting worse. Choice two, the, the client's able to take the radial pulse accurately. Um, that's wonderful that they can take the radial pulse accurately. We want them to take their pulse accurately, but that doesn't show whether the treatment's being effective or not. So that's not it. And then choice four, the client has minimal jugular vein distension. You guys see that word? Minimal. That means a little bit. Want to know what that means? The patient still has it. It's just a little bit. We don't want a little bit, we want none at all, okay? JVD, jugular vein distension, that's a sign and symptom of what? Fluid overload, and we don't want the patient to have that. So the only thing here that shows us that this patient's getting better is that they can perform more ADLs without becoming short of breath. The nurse is assessing a client diagnosed with CHF. Which lab data would indicate that a client has severe CHF? One, an elevated BNP, two, an elevated CKMB, three, a positive D-dimer, or four, a positive VQ scan. 
And the correct answer, guys, is elevated BNP. BNP, guys, is specific to uh, CHF. Okay, so when that's elevated, that's specific to let you know that that's what's going on with the patient. The patient's having heart failure. Now let's look at our other choices. CKNB, that's for myocardial infarction. Um, D-dimer and uh, VQ scan, those two are for PE when the patient's having a pulmonary embolism. Those are the tests for pulmonary embolism. So for this question, it's BNP because that is what's specific to heart failure. A healthcare provider has ordered an ACE inhibitor for the client diagnosed with CHF. Which discharge instructions should the nurse include? One, instruct the client to take a cough suppressant if a cough develops. Two, teach a client how to prevent orthostatic hypotension. Three, encourage the client to eat bananas to increase the potassium level. Or four, explain the importance of taking the medication with food. And the correct answer, guys, is to teach a client how to prevent orthostatic hypotension. So, guys, ACE inhibitors, you know, those are the meds that end in PRIL, P-R-L. Those, um, they bring down the blood pressure, okay? They cause uh, systemic vasodilation. So, it might make a patient bottom out. So, you're going to teach the patient ways to prevent orthostatic hypotension. So, when they move positions, that their blood pressure doesn't drop too quickly. So, you're going to teach them things like dangling, before um, uh, they get out of bed, sitting up with their legs dangled before they get out of bed. When they're getting out of bed, to do it slowly instead of just jumping up, just from sitting up to standing up slowly. And those are measures to prevent um, orthostatic hypotension. Now let's look at our wrong answer choices. One, instruct the client to take a cough suppressant if cough, if cough uh, develops. Actually, no, you're going to teach them to call the doctor right away if they develop a cough because this is a known adverse effect of um, ACE inhibitors. And there's so many other drugs on the market. Uh, the patient shouldn't have to live with this cough that won't go away, right? So if they develop a cough, you teach them to call the doctor right away and they will switch the patient to another blood pressure medication that doesn't cause the cough. Um, choice three, encourage a client to eat bananas to increase potassium level. Actually, ACE inhibitors may cause the patient to retain potassium, so that's not even necessary. And then we have choice four, explain the importance of taking the medication with food. Absolutely not. Um, ACE inhibitors are one of those meds that we do not want fighting for receptor sites in the gut. So we teach the patients to take this medication either an hour before they eat or two hours after eating, but do not take it with meals. So the correct answer is preventing orthostatic hypotension. Okay, the nurse on the telly unit has just received the morning shift report. Which client should the nurse assess first? One, the client diagnosed with MI who has an audible S3 heart sound. Two, the client diagnosed with CHF who has four plus sacral pitting edema. Three, the client diagnosed with pneumonia who has a pulse ox of 94%. Or four, the client with chronic renal failure who has an elevated creatinine level. I'm sure you guys all will get this correct because I've rammed this down your throat a million times by now. The correct answer is one. The client diagnosed with MI who's had a what? Audible S3 heart sound. How many times have I told you that that S3 is a symptom of a life-threatening condition, okay? So, which is ventricular failure. So that's who this you're gonna be running to first. We want to hear the love and we wanna hear the dub. We're not trying to hear any S3. All right, let's look at the wrong answer choices two. The client diagnosed with CHF who has four plus sacral pitting edema. They have CHF. We expect to see the pitting edema. We don't want it, but we expect to see it and it's not life-threatening. So there's no reason to be running to them first. Choice three, client with pneumonia who has a pulse ox of 94. Guys, we want the patient's pulse ox to be 98 to 100. If it's 95, we'll take it, but we prefer it to be 98 to 100. But for a patient that has pneumonia, which is infection of the lung, 
we want it to be 93 or higher. We'll take the 93, okay? So a patient who has pneumonia that's at 94, they still need to be assessed, but we're not running to them over the patient that has an S3 heart sound. And then choice four, the client with chronic renal failure who has an elevated creatinine level. That patient's in renal failure. Neither of their kidneys are working. We expect that creatinine to be elevated. So the patient you're going to be running to is that patient uh, with that S3 heart sound that um, signals possible ventricular failure. Okay, guys, let's talk about angina. Which cardiac enzyme would the nurse expect to elevate first in the client diagnosed with myocardial infarction? One, CKNB. Two, LDH. Three, troponin. Four, WBCs. Now, everybody should get this right because I just did a poll maybe like a week ago on this almost a verbatim. And so guys, the correct answer is troponin. We expect that to be elevated within one to two hours of the myocardial infarction. Now let's look at our other choices. Two, your CKMB, we expect that to be elevated about 12 to 24 hours after that cardiac assault. Choice two, your LDH, 24 to 36 hours after the myocardial infarction. And then Choice four, let's talk about four guys. So first of all, four is not a cardiac enzyme. Okay, WBCs, that's not a cardiac enzyme. It's a blood cell, it's a white blood cell, all right? That's number one. Number two, WBCs do become elevated after a myocardial infarction. And let me explain to you why. Remember, WBCs, those are are immunity cells, those are fighter cells. So whenever a patient has a myocardial infarction, which is a big assault to the heart, to the body, the WBCs are rushing in and they're screaming for help, help, help. They're calling the T cells, they're calling everybody, come help, 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 help. So that's why you see the WBCs um, elevate. It's elevating because of the necrotic tissue. When a patient has an MI, what that is, is the muscle of the heart itself does it get ox 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 doesn't get oxygen when it doesn't get oxygen it starts to what die okay so those necrotic cells is what signals the wbc's that something's wrong and then you see the wbc's go up because they're literally calling the body to come and help along with persistent crushing chest pain which sign symptoms would you make the nurse would make the nurse suspect that the client's experiencing a myocardial infarction one, mid-epigastric pain and pyrosis. Two, diaphoresis and clammy skin. Three, intermittent claudication and pallor. Four, jugular vein distension and dependent edema. And the correct answer, guys, is diaphoresis and cool, clammy skin. Why is this patient sweating so much? Why is, there, why, why is their um, skin cool and not warm? Here's what's happening. Patients having a heart attack. The body is meant to survive no matter what. So it's going to do everything it can to save itself. So what happens is that when you have a heart attack, you will experience systemic vasoconstriction. Every single vessel in your body will start to constrict. Why? It's trying to shunt blood to the heart. Why? What's in blood? Hemoglobin. What does hemoglobin carry? Oxygen. Why are you ha having a heart attack? Because the muscles of your heart don't have enough oxygen. You see how smart your body is? So you go through a systemic, especially in your peripheries, vasoconstriction because it's trying to shunt all that blood back to the heart. Okay. And so that's why you see those signs and symptoms. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, mid epigastric pain and pyrosis. We see this more in those patients with peptic ulcers. Three, intermittent claudication and pallor. We see that more in the patients with um, PVD, peripheral vascular disease. And choice four, jugular vein distension and dependent edema. You guys know that. We see that more in the patients that have heart failure. Okay, next question. <laughs> the client diagnosed with rule out myocardial infarction is experiencing chest pain while walking to the bathroom. Which action should the nurse implement first? One, administer sublingual nitroglycerin. Two, obtain a stat echo. Three, have the client sit down immediately. Four, assess the client's vital signs. Excuse me, number two said obtain a stat electrocardiogram. 
So anyway, guys, the correct answer is three, have the client sit down immediately. This is another one, guys, where the, the test writers are trying to trick you because they know you're so crazy about assessing, but it has to make sense. This is why you, you guys have to be critical thinkers, okay? If you look at the question, they told you the client has a diagnosis of myocardial infarction. They're experiencing chest pain while they're walking to the bathroom. Guys, anytime you do any movement, that increases the demand of your body for oxygen. Okay? We already know this patient already has limited capacity because of that diagnosis. So the first thing we're going to do is rest them. Before we assess them, before we ask them any questions, before we look, before we do any tests, we rest them. Whatever they were doing, stop. Why? We want to decrease the demand of oxygen on the body so that they can breathe better and get more oxygen, specifically to their heart, okay? So that's our correct answer. Um, all the other choices, the sublingual nitro, which is good, the stat electrocardiogram, which is good, assessing the vital signs, which is good, all of that stuff comes after you rest that patient, okay? All right, guys, we are down to our last question because I'm out of time. The nurse is caring for a client diagnosed with myocardial infarction who's experiencing chest pain. Which intervention should the nurse implement? Select all that applies. Now, guys, you know we treat select all that applies as what? True or false. So let's get into it. Number one, administer morphine intramuscularly. False. How do we give morphine to this patient? IV. Okay, choice two, administer an aspirin orally. Absolutely, why are we giving aspirin antiplatelet? What the last thing we need for this patient is for them to get a clot, okay? We want their blood nice and thin because we need that blood flow going for this type of patient, okay? So absolutely, we're gonna give them aspirin orally. Three, apply oxygen via nasal cannula. Absolutely, the whole problem is that heart muscle was not getting enough oxygen and tissue started to die. So yes, we're going to give them oxygen because that oxygen will decrease the schema and that schema will decrease the chest pain, the angina. Um, choice three, place the... Place the client in a supine position. Did I not just tell you when you want your patient to breathe, you sit them up? Don't play with me. So we know that's not correct. So we're going to move on. Last choice, choice number five, administer nitroglycerin subcutaneously. False. How do we give that nitro sublingually under the tongue? Guys, I hope this video... Um, was helpful. If you'd like to see more content on heart failure or myocardial angina or both, uh, please let me know in the content section, content, in the comment section. And I want to say to you guys, thank you so much. You guys have been supporting me for the past, I think, eight months that I've been making these videos and I truly appreciate the support. Um, please don't forget to, to like, and to subscribe below if you haven't done so already. Please share my content on social media with friends, family members, coworkers. And also don't forget to check me out on TikTok. Um, this is so crazy. I, I did my first video on Monday. So today makes one week since um, I made that video. And like on three of them, I'm already at a million views. This is awesome. I'm so happy that I'm able to deliver this information to you and hopefully um, you find it helpful. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you on the next video.